This is the story of creation. This is the succession plan of God's creation. Let me start right here at verse 3 and 4. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light, it was good. Verse 10. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Somebody say good. It was good. And the earth brought forth grass, verse 12, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Verse 16, then God made two great lights, the greater to rule the day, the lesser to rule by the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the dark. And God saw, verse 18, say, it was good. Uh, you're noticing a pattern here. Verse 21, and so God created the sea creatures, every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Go down to verse 25 for the sake of time. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and God saw it was good. Do you know what's happening here? God is creating and because there's no one there to praise him, he's praising himself. That's, that's a bad God right there. He's creating it, then he's stepping back and looking at what he just created, and he's saying, you're a bad God. So he creates it, then he blesses it. Then he creates it, then he blesses it. Then he creates it. And then, so everything he creates, he turns around and then blesses the thing he just created. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Do y'all shout here in Dallas? I just want to make sure. Tell your neighbor, say, do not let the white skin fool you. Tell them, do not. <laughs> Woo. Woo. So God is creating, turning around and blessing his creation. But then we go to verse 6. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. You're supposed to say good. And it, why did everything else get a good and the firmament got a so? There's something behind that curtain. We're going to pull it back. Father, bless the reading of your word. We love you. We're grateful. Grateful, grateful people. I pray that in these next few minutes that you would deposit something to everyone under the sound of my voice that is going to last long after this service is over. Bless our bishop and let everything that he puts his hands to succeed. Bless our first lady. Bless this house. Thank you for this opportunity. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. You may be seated right there where you are. Hallelujah. <laughs> it is my custom to get your neighbor ready. So tell your neighbor on both sides, here we go, neighbor. Here we go. <laughs> I'm 50 years into this southern accent. I don't think it's going to go anywhere now. Is it all right if I walk on the floor? Okay. Don't want to mess the sound men up. I like to get close. I don't like there to be a lot of distance between me and the people. And when I get real happy, I've been known to spit about seven rows deep. <laughs> so some lands on your shoulder. Don't wipe it off. That'll heal you. Just leave it there. <laughs> Let it sit there. <laughs> I 
Um, there is a difference between when you were created and when you were made. The word made means to take from one substance and make into another substance. God made you a body. He took from one thing and made it another thing. He took from the dust of the ground and he made, he formed Adam a body. But your body is not the real you. <laughs> your body just houses the real you. Your body is a temporary location while you fulfill an assignment in the earth. The Bible says that you were created in Christ Jesus before the foundations of the earth were ever laid. The word, G, the word uh, Christ means anointing, the anointed one, the anointing. So I was created in the anointing before God ever said, let there be light. The word created means to take from nothing. So the real you didn't show up when your mother and father biologically hooked up and conception took place. The real you was created in the anointing sometime in heaven before God ever laid the foundations of the world. And what God did is he took the real you and then formed you a body. And the real you is living inside this house. This is not your real house. This is not who you really are. Some of us, we have a, a, a tall house, a short house, a big house, a small house, a black house, a white house. My wife's a brick house. All kind of houses. Don't matter what kind of house you got. You just got to understand this is just a house. Tell your neighbor this is just a house. Just a house. Difference between when you were created and when you were made. By the way, if I sound a little nasally, um, I, I battled in a cold before I got here, and when we were descending in the plane, there was a big pop in this ear, and I can't hear a thing out of it. So I'm believing before I leave, somebody's going to agree with me, this ear is going to open back up. Amen? All right. So there's a, there's a difference between when you were created and when you were made. Now, Colossians 3, 1 through 3, I'm a teacher, so let me, let me roll this out, says that you have died and your life is hidden with God in Christ. Here again, Christ means anointing. Let me tell you something about the anointing. His name is Jesus Christ. I don't want to insult your intelligence, but I don't want to assume anything. Jesus Christ. Christ is not his last name. Christ is his function. He is Jesus the anointing. Jesus the anointed one. Jesus the man came, died on the cross, rose again, and then went and sat at the right hand of the Father, and there he ever makes intercession for you and me. The man Jesus came, and he's back with the Father. Christ never left the earth. Whew. I'm going somewhere with this. For those of you who don't know me, it seems like I'm going to open up a bunch of random loose ends, but at the end we'll tie them all together, I promise you, okay? Christ never left the earth. He just waited in the earth for another body to descend upon. And so in the upper room, he found the body, the new body of Christ. And then he descended upon that new body. And now we make up the body of Christ. We make up the body of the anointing. Come on, somebody. I'm not a full expression of the anointing. You're not a full expression of the anointing. But God gives us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, evangelists, teachers, until we all reach the full stature of the measure of Christ. So God gives us leaders till we all come into unity in the faith. And I may not be like Christ all by myself, but when I hook up with you and you and you and you and you, then we begin to be the full expression of the body of the anointing. Somebody shout, I'm anointed. I'm anointed. Now, the Bible says my life is hidden with Christ. My life is hidden with God in the anointing. Everything about me, my past, my present, my future, is in my anointing. The anointing is the word that is descriptive of the residency of the Holy Ghost. Everything that I will ever be is already in me. So God doing something in my life is not coming out the air conditioning vent and coming externally and entering my life. It's already in me and I've got to learn how to push it out. Everything that you will ever do and ever be is already on the inside of you. Touch your neighbor and say, it's already in there. It's already in there. So I've got to learn how do I grab a hold of the potential that is resting inside of my anointing and then live up to the potential of my anointing. Then in the next verse he says, therefore set your mind on 
on things above where Christ is. So in other words, I've got to take my anointing where my whole potential is and then set my mind on things above where the anointing is. It's not a matter of are you anointed, it's can you think on the level of your anointing. When you can get your mind in the same place with your, what if you're anointed to be wealthy but you think like a pauper? What if you're anointed to be great but you think like a weakling? What if you are anointed to be successful but you think like a failure? We do not arrive at the place of our anointing. We arrive at the place of our thoughts because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. My thinking defines my is, and if I'm going to show up where my anointing is, I'm going to have to learn to think on the level of my anointing. Somebody that's going to take your thinking higher today, shout hallelujah. Woo! I'm just getting going here. Roll with me. So when God wants something, he does not speak to what is. He speaks to what holds it and commands what holds it to turn it loose. Stay with me. Remember, your whole life is in your anointing. So when God wants something, when God, God didn't say, let there be grass and potatoes and cucumbers and tomatoes. God said, let the earth bring forth. In other words, the potential for every food was already in the earth. So God told the earth, give up what's already in you. He said, turn loose of your potential. He didn't call the thing. He called what was holding the thing to turn the thing loose because the thing was already inside of it. Come on, somebody. He didn't say, let there be Uranus, Jupiter, Pluto, Mars. He said, let the heavens bring forth. And everything was already in the heavens that was there for the potential of the moon and the planets and the stars. So he didn't speak to the thing. He spoke to what held it and told what was holding it to turn it loose. God didn't say, let there be sea bass, and let there be halibut, and let there be catfish. He said, let the waters bring forth. Go read it. He said, let the waters bring forth, because the potential for fish was already in the water. So he said, water, turn it loose. Earth, turn it loose. Skies, turn it loose. And when God wanted to make man, he turned around and talked to himself. He said... God, turn them loose, turn them loose, turn them loose, because you were God's potential. And God had to turn around to himself, and he spoke to himself, and he gave up me, and he gave up you. Would you take 30 seconds if you know that you didn't just come from mama and daddy, but you came out of God, and God, when he wanted you, turned you loose from his own being. Somebody shout hallelujah in this place. Now I feel the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We got a ways to go. We got a ways to go. I'm telling you something about to happen. I've been feeling it. I've been praying for you. I've been praying for you. Something's about to be turned loose. God's going to speak to your potential. And your spirit's about to give up some. So when a word like this goes forth, God's not trying to get something from the outside in. God already knows it's in you, and he's going to man your anointing. Turn it loose today. Turn up the next season. Turn loose the next level. Turn loose the next job. Turn loose the next harvest. I came here today because I believe this is a day God's going to speak to your spirit and tell your spirit, turn it loose. Hallelujah. Woo. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. (laughs) Thought number three. I'll bring them all together. The first thing God created was not the heavens and the earth. The third thing God created was, the first thing God created was a sound. And God said. And if God had not have made that sound, there would have been no heaven and earth. First thing was not light. First thing was God said. If God had not said, there wouldn't have been light. The first thing God did into the darkness and to the void 
was he spoke and made a sound. And everything responded to the sound. Whew. I have noticed that every great power in the earth is accompanied by a great sound. There is nothing in the earth that has great power that does not also make a great sound. I'm a country boy, raised on a farm down in deep parts of South Carolina. I had a railroad track behind my house, 100 yards. And you could hear that diesel engine in 30 minutes before it got to behind my house. And with that great power for that diesel engine to pull a mile of freight, it also accompanied with it a great sound. And that sound would make the, make the pictures on the walls of the house shake. <laughs> I've lived through one tornado. I was in a freezer at a gas station. It was following me down the interstate, and I turned in, and everybody waved me in the inter in the state, and they went into the freezer in the middle of it. And we got in the freezer, and that thing came right over the top of us and tore the building apart, but it didn't move that freezer because it was, it was actually bolted into the concrete. But I remember not only the ferocious power of that tornado, but I remember the rumble of the sound that it made as it went over my head. I'm still amazed after all these years of aviation that you can get something that weighs several hundred thousand pounds to move 550 miles an hour in the air. But have you ever noticed everybody at the airport has something covered? Because with the great power of those engines, it also is accompanied by a great sound. I used to take down big oak trees with a chainsaw. But even that chainsaw that could take down the mighty oak tree, we had to keep our ears plugged all day because something that had the power to take down the tree was accompanied by a great sound. There is no significant power in the earth that is not accompanied by significant sound. It bothers me that our churches are getting so quiet. It bothers me that we're losing our roar and we're losing our shout and we're losing our passion and we're giving way to letting people entertain us. But the fact is, when a church loses its sound, it begins to lose its power. You can't remove power from sound. You can't remove sound from power. They go hand in hand. And the fact is, if I want a powerful church, I'm going to have to have a church that makes a great sound. There is no way to have great power without having a great sound. I came to stir something up in here if I can and just agitate the waters in this atmosphere a little bit. Why? Because you've got to understand the first thing the enemy wants to take from you is your sound. And if he can just get you to be quiet, if he can just get you depressed enough, if he can just get you isolated enough, if he can just get you where you're disappointed enough and you're down enough and you lose your sound, he takes away your power. But I came to open my mouth and let the enemy know I'm going to release a sound into the atmosphere because when the sound comes up, so does the power come up. I'm going to give you about 10 seconds to shoot some power in this atmosphere. Shoot some power through those TV cameras. Shoot some power through that stage. Is anybody in this building say, I will not let the enemy have my sound. Somebody shout in this this place, hallelujah, I feel a moving of the Spirit of God right now in this place. If you ain't shouting in a week, shout. If you ain't shouting in a month, shout. Just make sure you get your sound back. Oh, I feel something happening. High five, five people say, get it back, get it back. Get your shout back, get your sound back. Get it back. If you see somebody not shouting, shout for them. Hallelujah. Shout for them. If you see somebody letting this moment pass them by, say, no, I'm, if you won't make a sound in your house, I'm going to make a sound in your house. we got to keep a sound. Nothing happens unless you make a sound.
Can I go deeper? I feel that ear starting to open up a little bit. Hallelujah! I make a sound in the power. Now, sound precedes precedes, goes before, manifestation. <laughs> Sound precedes manifestation. This is where we have to shift because we want God to move and then we want to respond with a sound. <laughs> not understand, not understanding that you have to make a sound when nothing's happening. And manifestation follows the sound you make. So it's when I see no activity going on in my life and it looks like there is no movement on any level whatsoever, that's when you got to look ridiculous and begin to open your mouth and begin to lift your voice and make a shout because nobody around you sees any activity. But God does not come before the sound. God rides in on the sound that you make. And so I've got to send forth the sound in the atmosphere because the Bible... But I, Elijah said, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. And then after the sound came, then the manifestation of rain came. He didn't see the rain first. He heard the sound of the rain first. Come on, Jehoshaphat, there was a sound of praise that went out, and then God threw the enemy in confusion. It wasn't they praised God after the enemy was confused. It was their sound confused the enemy. Come on, somebody. The walls of Jericho did not fall down before sound. They had to shout while the walls were still standing up. And then when they shouted and made a sound, the walls came tumbling down. The bones didn't come together. And then Ezekiel started praising God. God told him, talk, 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 prophesy. And when you speak, the bones will start coming together and living again. Oh, God, I feel something happening in this place. There was a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. And then tongues of fire came and sat upon them. We didn't get the Holy Ghost first. Somebody said a sound. And then after the sound, the Holy Ghost followed the sound. I'm about to run all over this building. Somebody shout to God because we got to get our sound back church we got to get our sound back <laughs> I'm feeling this thing Y'all watch out now. I got that old time Holy Ghost. I'll start, buck, I'll start bucking on you, y'all. Have y'all still got your buck? You know how to, woo, hallelujah. You, you are in charge of how much God you experience. Well, we're coming into church. I hope we have a good service today. God's never had a bad service. Whether or not we have a great service is not based on God. It's based on you. It's based on me. God don't have bad services. God don't have down days. The Bible says he inhabits the praise of his people. That means he dwells, he abides in, he lives in. So that means if I give God a little praise then I experience a small God. I am in charge of the square footage that I build for God to live in. 
the square footage that God, the space that God occupies is the square footage and the magnitude of the praise that I give him. So those of you that want a little God, then just give God a casual little praise. But there's some of us in here that have bigger problems than that. I don't need a little God. I need a great, big God. And if I want to see a great big God, I've got to give God a great, a great big praise. I am in charge of whether or not I have a great day. I'm in charge of whether or not they have a great service. And somebody that don't need a small God, but you need a big God to show up in your situation. I want you to increase the square footage of the place that God lives in. I'm going to give you about 15 seconds to do that in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let the women build God a house. Let the men build God a house. Let the children build. Let the potter's house build God a house. Oh, I feel the Spirit of God rising in this building right now. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, say, you got to sit down, neighbor. You got to sit down. Let me go a little deeper. Sound seals destiny. So stay with me. Every great power in the earth is accompanied by a great sound. Sound precedes manifestation. Sound seals destiny. See, everything in life follows the sound that it makes. I don't have to know you. I can tell you exactly where you're headed. Just let me listen to your sound. <laughs> can I just get real practical? If you don't like the way, the direction something's headed, change the sound. <laughs> you don't like the way your marriage is going, change the sound in your house. Oh, it got quiet right there. I lost my shouters. You don't like the way your money's headed, change the sound that you make. Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let a dysfunctional home say we have peace. Come on, somebody. Let, the, let, the, let those that are in poverty say I am prosperous. Let those that feel like they're in a dry place say I am blessed. You've got to put the sound out there, and then your life begins to move in the direction. I've never seen a car go one way and the sound go the other. I've never seen a jet go this way and the sound go one way. Wherever the sound goes, the jet's following. Wherever the sound goes, the cars following. The sound that you make your life is moving right behind it. If you don't like where it's headed, just change the sound. <laughs> if If you are watching your TV, if you're watching your TV and the picture is showing you a woman walking down a sidewalk downtown in a blue dress, you know nothing about her future based on what you see. Even the motion picture industry knows they're carrying you somewhere with what you're hearing, not with what you're seeing. We do not live by sight. 
Don't look at where I am and think you know where I'm headed. We don't live by sight. You know nothing about my future by what you see. <laughs> so if you were to see the picture and cut off the volume, you know nothing of the woman's future. <laughs> you just see the picture. Play me, play me something, Terrence. Play me, play me something happy. <laughs> okay, she's, she's going on a date. She's going out with friends. It's her birthday. She's going to grandma's house. What told you that? If you take the same woman, same sidewalk, same scene, same blue dress, and you hear this, boom, 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 you starting to sink down in your seat and your eyeballs getting about this big right here and you starting to lean to the left because you know any minute Jason coming out from behind the bush going to cut that Achilles heel on her leg, going to go flapping. What? Same woman, same dress, same sidewalk, but a different sound. And you started getting prepared for her future. Woo, Hallelujah by the sound that you heard. Somebody needs to start getting prepared for your future because the sound you've been making is about to unlock something great in your life. Hallelujah. You ain't seen it yet, but you've been making the right sound. Hold on, sister. Hold on, brother. Your sound will produce. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost in this building. That's why First Lady, that's why David said that to lead worship, he had skilled musicians. <laughs> I know what caliber of musicians they have at this church. But see, for me, I love you, but you can't lead worship for me if you started taking lessons Monday. <laughs> because God moves on the sound. He did in the upper room. He did with the rain. He did with the dry bones. He did on his own voice. He did in creation. So God doesn't move till a sound has been put out there. <laughs> and then God moves on the back of the sound. I know I didn't prep anybody from this. We've come in here Let's say the enemy has been attacking the people of this house. The enemy has been attacking the vision of this house. Let's say the enemy has been attacking the leaders of this house. So it's a time where we go into so spiritual warfare. It's a time where we go in to get victory. Give me a, give me a tribal beat, sir. Just give me something tribal. And I've come to get some men who will go into the enemy's camp. And before us is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he goes before us, we will send our praise first. And we will go into the enemy's camp and lay our weapons down and open up our voice. And when the God has come and crushed our enemy, we will move in and we will take the spoils of victory and grab defeat. Somebody give me a shout of war! Just lost a loved one going through a di very difficult time in my life. Take me beside still waters. Yeah, raise that up, little sound man. Fill the whole room with those strings, little. Come on, raise it up. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters.
He restores my soul. It leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And even when I have enemies, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You went from healing waters right out of tribal warfare and what made the shift? The sound. <laughs> now, <laughs> let me start tying it up. If you would like to be seated a moment, this is a good time. I know what you're asking. You're saying, what does any of this have to do with Genesis chapter 1? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> God created and then he turned around and blessed the thing that he created. Except for one thing. He created the firmament, and he didn't say it's good. He said it's so, and he kept walking. One thing in his creation that did not get his blessing. That's the kind of preacher I am. See, I think that's where the hidden stuff is, in the little thing. And I just can't, I just can't read over that and leave it alone. I got to know why. That thing called the firmament, what is a firmament, and why did God refuse to bless it? First thing you need to understand is that Satan and a third of heaven rebelled and they were thrown out of heaven. Satan is not in hell. Good preaching. Good shouting. And all the demons in hell. <laughs> good, good church. Terrible theology. <laughs> For we wrestle against principalities, power, spiritual wickedness in. <laughs> Satan is not in hell. Read Revelation 19 and 20. Hell is reserved for him. <laughs> Hell is reserved. But he's not there now. But he got cast out of heaven. Where did he go? <laughs> the word firmament in the Hebrew Old Testament text is the exact same word paralleled in the New Testament Greek word, air. And the Bible clearly defines that Satan is the prince of the power of the firmament. So God, before there even was angels created, wherever angels created, in his foreknowledge knew of the rebellion and created a space that could detain evil for a while until they would get their eternal judgment. And knowing who would reside there, he created a firmament, but because evil would live there, refused to bless it. This is getting good, isn't it? <laughs> so now we have the first heaven. We have three heavens according to the Bible. It's the earth's atmosphere. It starts about 12 inches above your head. 
John, when he got the revelation, was taken into the third heaven, which is the abode of God. Okay? Then we have in the middle the heavenlies. Old Testament firmament, New Testament air. Dilemma. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. He said, I want you to pray like this. He said, pray that my kingdom would come and my will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. He said, pray like this. Pray that the life that is in number three would manifest in number one. My problem is it has to pass through. So Jesus said, I'll give you the keys. Whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind it in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, I'll loose it in heaven. In other words, he said, if you unlock it, I'll unlock it. If you close it up, I'll close it up. <laughs> I've got just a tad bit more teaching to do. Can I, can I get it? Y'all done flew me all the way here. Let me get it all out. Let me get it all out. Do y'all have Waffle Houses here in Dallas? Y'all have Waffle Houses? I'll get you out of here for Waffle House clothes. Hang on here with me. I got thinking about Waffle House. I forgot where I was. Jesus is not a religious figure. Jesus is a political figure. He's a king. The Bible is not a religious book. The Bible is a political document. It speaks of a kingdom. Jesus specifically let us know that his entrance into this earth was not just salvation, but it was the entrance of a kingdom. When a king speaks of a kingdom, he's talking about extending his rule. So Jesus is talking about extending God's rule out of heaven into the earth realm. And he says, this is how the kingdom will work. It will have access keys. He said, if you use these keys, you can live in the earth and access heaven. He said, if you use them, I'll open heaven up. He says, if you don't use them, heaven will stay closed. So, I noticed, but I don't have time to go through all these scriptures, so some of them you've got to go back and study them yourself. I don't have time, to, so I'm going to quote them. I noticed just as there are three heavens, there are three levels of praise. I went, hmm. Maybe there's a key to this thing. If you would let me in a kind of a cartoonish way, can I tell you what I think is happening? God, I ask that what's in number three that you have for me? We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. He's supplied all of our needs according to his riches and glory. So God has given me everything he's got, but it's in heavenly places. And God has supplied all my needs, but it's in glory. We don't have any needs. The problem is they're in a different dimension. He's given us every spiritual blessing. How many does every mean? That's why Jesus said it's finished. I got nothing else to give you. I gave you everything. And it's all in heavenly places. Oh, I got bombs going off of me. Faith... 
The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is sight. So when God says that something is invisible, it does not mean that it does not exist. It means that your eye does not have the ability to perceive the image. While we look not at the things which are, uh, are seen, but the things which are unseen. How do you look at things unseen? For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are unseen are eternal. So God's telling me to focus on things that my eyes can't perceive. Don't focus on what you can see. Focus on the invisible. So faith is not me creating something that doesn't exist. Faith is me moving something from one dimension to another dimension. So my kingdom will come and my will will be done, every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, on earth as it is in heaven. Okay. Is this all right? So, I believe what the Bible says when God said, when you pray, believe you have received. So, when do I believe that I've received? the moment I prayed. God answered my prayer when I prayed it. Well, why am I still praying it 20 years later? We're about to get a key. <laughs> what if God unloaded 20, 30 years of unanswered prayers in your life in one day because God answered everything you've ever prayed, but it's been held up in another dimension. <laughs> See, I'm not sure I believe it. Daniel, pray. God sent the messenger angel. Most people believe it to be Gabriel, the messenger angel. Gabriel was a musical angel, messenger angel. He was a worshiping angel. Gabriel was very skilled at making sounds. I'm telling you, I'm going to run all the way down the street and come back drinking a Sprite. I feel the Holy Ghost. So Daniel prayed and God answered the prayer the moment Daniel prayed. When you pray, believe you have received. But he didn't show up till 21 days later. And when Daniel finally showed up, this is Ron's paraphrase, what happened? I prayed 21 days ago. He says, God sent me the moment you pray. But I was detained by the prayer. When I left number three, I got hung up in number two. And there was a great conflict because what's going on in the heavenlies did not want you to get this answer. He said, so I sent for Michael. Michael, the great warring angel in all of the pavilions of heaven with his long sword and shield. Gabriel said, I can't fight, but I can make a sound. And when you make a sound, God shows up. Somebody help me in this building. Shout back at me if you know what I'm, I might not be able to fight him. I might not be able to beat him by myself, but I know how to make a sound. Shout hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, say, let him finish, let him finish. <laughs> I think what has been happening, First Lady, 
think God has answered every one of your prayers. All of them. But I believe there are forces running around in the realm of the firmament, the second heaven, that are every time God sends one there. It's not that God did not answer us, that they have not made it through. <laughs> because just as there are three heavens, <clears throat> there are three levels of praise. Touch your neighbor and say, God does it in threes. The first level of praise I see in the Word of God is the Bible says there is a praise that silences the enemy. <laughs> I really try to be contextually accurate. I don't like gimmicky preaching. I, the Bible does not tell me what that praise looks like. It doesn't say that a clap does it or a raised hand or it doesn't say. I believe it is a level of fervency, intensity that is given to it. That's my personal interpretation because I believe prayer is the same way. There is all kinds of prayer, but the Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer. So the one that I press into, Jesus prayed and his sweat became like drops of, but there is an intensity to it. When we, when we approach her, the kingdom does not come to the casual. <laughs> the kingdom comes to the seeker. Seek ye first. The fringe Christian will never enter the things of the kingdom. They will be saved, but the kingdom comes after people who seek it. So there is a level of intensity in my praise that God says silences the enemy. That's no small thing. He's the father of lies, and he's lying in your head the whole time. And the only thing he's trying to get you to do is agree with him. Because if he can throw something in your head and you agree with him, if any two touch on earth and agree... So there is a level of praise that shuts him up, if you would. Then there's a second level that I noticed in the Bible that the psalmist wrote. He said, there is a praise that steals the enemy. Uh-oh. Now we're taking it up a notch. So now I've entered a level of praise that renders him inactive. He can't talk. And all of his activity has been stilled against me. But then I noticed there was this third level of praise. Three heavens, three levels of praise. <laughs> there is this third level of praise, and it's called the shout. It is the pinnacle of praise because the Hebrew word for shout means to take an enemy and tear apart piece by piece by piece. No wonder our churches have gotten so quiet. We've become quiet, we've become pretty, we've become polished, and we've become impotent. There is, there is an intensity of my praise called the shout. Shouting is exhausting. <laughs> when you go home after an extremely interactive service of praise, you are absolutely exhausted because the shout is encompassing physical, emotional, mental, spiritual power and harnessing it in one powerful expression. But it is that expression that doesn't just shut your enemy up. It does not just render him inactive. But if I'm reading my Bible right, it actually lessens the number against me.
And I waited for Bishop to put perimeters on me because I'm a wild little holiness boy. I was raised in churches in the back. My daddy pastored backwood country churches where people showed up barefooted and there was a bell in the top. I came from what looked like Little House on the Prairie and I'm not but 51. All the toilets were outside where I came from. Okay. I saw more miracles. We had to see miracles because what I grew up in, they didn't believe in doctors and aspirin. God better heal your headache because they didn't believe in aspirin. Y'all don't know them kind of people. Y'all don't know. That's what I, that's the kind of folk I was raised in. They went to God for everything. They didn't go to counselors. I believe in, they didn't do nothing. They get out, they went, if they knew your marriage was struggling, the church mothers would come and get you out of the pew on row four and bring you down and you didn't come up till they said you was through. You start lifting your head like I've had enough, they push your head right back down. We ain't got you all the way out yet. You stay right there. I saw unbelievable things that I see none of today. None. Come on, I'm just calling it like it is. I see none of it. I'm talking about gorders falling off neck and a piece of flesh sitting there on the floor and the custodian have to clean it up. Devils cast out. That was common. That was common. That was about every third song. <laughs> and I'm not talking about it's decreased. I mean, I see none of it. 